over 10 years, Formula Ford has been the essential first rung of the ladder to fame in single-seater racing. Formula One drivers like world champions James Hunt and Emerson Fittipaldi, Jody Schechter and Ireland's new Grand Prix star Derek Daly started racing at the wheel of a Formula Ford, which has turned Formula Ford into a proving ground for future world champions. As 1978 began, a thousand delusional Formula Ford racers shared the Formula One dream. At age 23, I was one of them, and I knew time was running out. I was also back in the media business as the art director for SCCA's Sports Car Magazine, working for the new publisher, Paul Oxman, but I was still an undisciplined California man-child. I'd moved into an apartment with Sports Car's new editor, Steve Nicholas, who was from Massachusetts and behaved like a functioning adult. We were very different, but we bonded through our mutual passion for American and British Formula Ford racing. Steve soon introduced me to fellow New Englander and Formula Ford ace David Lurie, who drove the Eagle Formula Ford for my hero, Dan Gurney. David quickly put me in my place by telling me that my stories about the five Formula Ford races I'd driven in took me longer to tell than the combined time they took to run. He had a good point. By age 21, David had won Formula Ford championships in Canada and the United States, and in the early 70s, he was viewed as America's next Formula One prospect. In 1972, David competed in British Formula Ford, where he was selected as the most talented up-and-coming driver by the British motor racing press. In 1974, David substituted for an injured Gilles Villeneuve in Canadian Formula Atlantic, but nothing else came of it. David's career stalled. He was back to Formula Ford, where he was his own mechanic and also hand-building every Eagle Formula Ford made. David was a true natural talent who raced from his heart like Ronnie Peterson, whose sideways style he admired. But David knew there hadn't been an American Formula One world champion since 1961. They were getting all set for the Italian Grand Prix. One of the Ferraris was to be driven by Wolfgang von Trips, the German ace. And in the Ferrari team was Phil Hill of America. Von Trips, on the right, was in the front row of the grid as they got away on the 267-mile race of 43 laps. During the race occurred one of the worst accidents of recent years. Unknown to Phil Hill and some of the others, Von Trips had been killed when his car was in collision with Jim Clark's Lotus. Fourteen spectators were killed too. The race went on and Hill won at an average of 130 miles an hour. The American didn't know of the tragedy when they congratulated him on being the new world champion. As the Formula One season began in Argentina, there were now four Americans who would attempt to qualify. But only one of them had a realistic shot at victory and becoming America's next world champion in 1978. The Lotus of American ace Mario Andretti started from pole position and in third place returning to Lotus was Ronnie Peterson. He had signed as a number two to Andretti. The American was happy and the Swede, well, he would honour his contract throughout the season. The race was largely about Mario Andretti. He ran away from the opposition and hit 13 seconds ahead of Nicky Lauda by the chequered flag. February's Sports Car Magazine cover featured the launch of a new era for the SCCA VW Super V Series, along with the beginning of an exciting new collaboration with photographer Jeff Swart, an art center student who energized me with his creative vision and his ambition. My freelance illustration business was also taking off as I created concept illustrations for the various Super V chassis builders. With real-world responsibilities like rent and a car payment, I had no budget to race. Thankfully, my friend Doug Stokes, who was the president of the International Karting Federation, put me in his own cart for three races. I won my first novice race, but crashed out of the other two races, and I was rewarded with a cracked rib as payback for my rough driving. The day after my painful kart racing karma lesson, I attended the SCCA National Races at Riverside, where David Loring was the man to beat in a huge Formula Ford field stacked with talent. I also spent time with Mike Hall, whose team management duties now included overseeing the new ADF Mark II of Mike Mokler, who I'd competed with during my first SCCA driver school race. 
With the March issue came the departure of sports cars editor Steve Nicholas, who didn't enjoy living in Southern California. Steve also likely tired of my immaturity and strange nocturnal work schedule. But then came what would prove to be a life-changing offer from SCCA pro racer Tom Spaulding to test drive his Ski Can-Am car. What followed was a fateful road trip with Jeff Swart in his Porsche 914-6. We headed north to Paso Robles, California, where Tom Spaulding's race team was based. Jeff wanted to measure the ski to help create custom camera mounts to capture speed from new perspectives. And along the way, we discussed our admiration for the clean design, emotive photography, and compelling content found in the best racing magazines in Europe and Great Britain. We agreed that American racers and fans deserved a high-quality magazine, so we promised ourselves that someday we would make our dream a reality, just as my dream of getting behind the wheel of a big, fast, and powerful racing car was about to become real. Driving the ski was truly a revelation. The faster I went, the better it felt. But I was still inexperienced, and I pushed too hard too soon while Jeff pushed the limits of racing photography by placing his cameras in revolutionary locations that captured the speed and emotional power of racing. But that day, Jeff wasn't alone in trying to do this. Tom Spaulding was also testing a revolutionary idea. They created one of the first live onboard TV camera systems that would take the audience into the center of racing's action and held enormous potential for the future of the sport. In 1978, enormous potential was literally in the air. The JPS Lotus 78, a wing car, which sucks itself down onto the road with a force about twice its own weight. But underneath, from the safety point of view, a great deal has changed, which must be a supreme comfort to the man who drives this car. Like Jim Clark, he's a former winner of, Indi winner of Indianapolis. He had his first drive in a Lotus in the year that Jim Clark had his last drive. Mario Andretti. Mario, 10 years ago, a thing like this would have been unbelievable wouldn't it, from the safety point of view? I mean, you didn't even have seat belts in those days, right? Well, that's very true. Uh, we've come a long way, there's no question about it. Uh, in that also, in the speed. Now, by increasing the speed, obviously, you increase the danger factor, and uh, to go along with that, uh, the safety aspect becomes that much more important. And increasing the speed was exactly what Team Lotus founder Colin Chapman had in mind with his all-new Lotus 79. It would forever change the sport. A change of a different type was also in the atmosphere of American racing. Gentlemen, start your engine! With the recent passing of Indianapolis Motor Speedway owner Tony Holman, there was now a leadership vacuum in USAC IndyCar racing. And my hero, Dan Gurney, stepped forward to fill it with a white paper that suggested much could be learned from how Bernie Ecclestone had transformed and grown Formula One to benefit struggling team owners. Formula One was also influencing IndyCar racing in other ways. With the demise of the short-lived Parnelli Jones Formula One effort came a new initiative to develop the compact chassis design and the Ford Cosworth DFV engine into the turbocharged DFX in the hope that it would become an Indy 500 winning package. McLaren soon followed suit with the F1 World Championship winning M23 design evolving into the M24 IndyCar design which was also used by Penske Racing. Now Roger Penske was doing the same thing. And the worlds of Formula One and USAC IndyCar racing were becoming more alike. We have a two-car Indy team this year at uh, Ontario. We have Mario Andretti versus the current World Driving Championship leader and Tom Sneaver, the United States Auto Club champion, 1977. We have our own cars, Penske cars, that have been built in England, and this is the first time that my team has run with our own cars. We've always used the McLaren cars, similar to the one John Redford will drive, and this year we made a big step to build our own car. Hopefully. It'll be the right one. He's about to get underway and on the pole, Tom Sneva. In the first row, the outside, Mario Andretti. In the second row, the inside, Johnny Lefford, car to the fourth. Next to him, Danny and Ryan, car to the 25 meter stroke car. But unhappy surprises are part of racing, even for Roger Penske. <laughs> Unhappy IndyCar surprises were very familiar. And in this crisis, they took nine of the best crew because 
It was a brave new era, and Roger Penske was ready with a big bet on the future named Rick Mears, who would substitute for Mario Andretti when he was racing in Formula One. In early April, the Long Beach Grand Prix showcased the talent of another young North American racer. Ferrari dominated the front row of the grid. A big thumbs up for Michelin. Big disappointment for Goodyear playing on home soil. Down into the first turn, Nicky Lauda lunged for the lead. Chill Villeneuve took advantage of the confusion. Only in his seventh Formula One race, Villeneuve impressed the American audience. Despite Mario Andretti's presence in the race, they cheered on what they saw as the next best thing to a compatriot. The race was soon to end for Villeneuve. On lap 39, he came alongside Regazzoni and Jean-Pierre Jabouy. Trying to lap them, he found himself in an untenable situation and into the barriers. Andretti claimed second place, but with win at number two, Reutemann moved himself strongly into the championship frame. Then the vulnerable world of IndyCar racing fell to earth when the leadership of USAC perished in a plane crash while returning from the Trenton round of the series. Two weeks later, USAC's brightest star took another step toward his destiny when Mario delivered the first victory for Colin Chapman's revolutionary Lotus 79. Now it was time for the May ritual that had driven me forward to my destiny since the age of nine. Indianapolis Speedway is a sentimental place for all its accent on technical excellence and harsh reality. That sentiment was personified by the much admired owner of the track, Tony Holman, who died last autumn. There's been a lot of speculation and some mystery this month as to who would succeed Tony to utter the words, gentlemen, start your engine. Well, most appropriately, it is going to be the widow of Tony Holman, Mary Holman. There's Mrs. Holman now, obviously moved by this one. Lady and gentlemen, start your engines. A sentimental moment at Indianapolis, Mrs. Mary Holman, another first for Indy. Not too many years ago, women were not even allowed in the pits or the garage area. Now we have a woman driver in the race and a woman officially starting the race with the phrase, as you heard, lady and gentlemen, start your engines. And that's what has happened. There is the man on the pole, Tom Sneva. This is the time when 32 men and a woman are looked at by hundreds of thousands on the scene and many millions more watching on television. Nonetheless, they're all alone, like these men on the front row. But my attention was on the last row of the grid. And then there's Mario Andretti. He was off winning the Grand Prix of Belgium last weekend after being rained out here the week before. That meant that a substitute, Mike Hiss, had to qualify his car for him. That's perfectly legal, but the rule also states that a car driven by a man other than the man who qualified it must be started at the back of the pack. Andretti then, in perhaps the fastest car of all, number seven, are dead last. There they are. There were a couple of pace cars out in front originally, and one of them was young Tony George, the grandson and namesake of the late Tony Holman, and his daughter Mary was with him too. Here they come to the starting line, and the green flag is out. They're reaching Indianapolis. And it's Danny and Gaius quickly taking the lead from Tom Stevens. My goodness, the two lead cars. Danny and Gaius, who's famous for his effort from the beginning of a race in car number 25, the black car. There you see him. But quite a jump on the rest of the field. Mario rapidly moved up from 33rd to 12th. Mario Andretti coming into the pits now. He has just passed A.J. Foyt, remember. He looks like he's going to be short. He's, well, he's, he's way on the road. He's in the wrong pit. He just got his hands up and disgusted himself. The engine stopped. He stalled his engine. Mario Andretti, what a terrible error. He's passed. A man who may well win the 1978 World Grand Prix Formula One Drivers' Championship. One of the great drivers of our time. There's something wrong there. They're looking at the back of the car. This is not a scandal pit stop. Danny and Gaius was next to experience the Andretti curse. All of a sudden, the second place car probably has had it. Oh, See that? Danny and Gaius has driven so well. Great drive. You must be very disappointed. Did you enjoy that race uh, with Alan, sir? Well, it was going to begin to tighten up toward the end. It was very nice. That day, Destiny called for Al Unser. It's all over. It took something over three hours to do in intense heat and humidity at Indianapolis. I would suspect he's not feeling it very much right now. Al's third Indy 500 win was the start of something bigger for himself and team owner Jim Hall. That day, I was also reminded that courage is immortal. Janet, a lot of people said a woman could never drive 500 miles, and here you are. Tell us a little about the feeling of the race. 
Sam, I was driving with one hand. <laughs> is that true? Uh, uh, is that because you were uh, trying to rest the other hand? No, I had a little problem a couple of days ago. I uh, actually have a broken wrist, and, and uh, um, so you know, I drove with one hand. I was when I had to shift, I held on with my right hand and ran my uh, left hand across the cockpit to shift with. That was pit stops and yellows. So uh, you know, I mean, what is this nonsense about women can't do it? <laughs> By the June issue, Sports Car Magazine now had a brave new editor named Lorna Fitz. And I had a talented new assistant art director named Suzette Catheron, who was also David Loring's girlfriend. Racing is truth, and the truth for me was that I wanted to race more than I wanted to create magazines. But I needed to face the truth that the magazine I'd helped launch and had left two years earlier was getting much better without me. My friend Pete Lyons and his colleague Jim McQueen were worthy competitors as I raised my game. Just as the Team Lotus duo of Mario Andretti and his friend Ronnie Peterson had raised their collective game, to a level that was nearly unbeatable. An all black and gold front row behind Lauda and Reutemann on row two. Lauda gives a glimmer of hope for the opposition. He'll close to just two seconds behind the race leader, but Peterson plays the dutiful number two and slows to hold up the Austrian in the Bramham Alpha. It launches him further forward in the championship race Another three points ahead of his major rival, his own teammate. And Andretti could win the title at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. The September issue of Sports Car had my friend Bobby Ray Hall on the cover and a feature on David Loring, who would soon be out of a ride and a job because Dan Gurney decided to shut down the Eagle Formula Ford program at season's end. My co-conspirator Jeff Swart wrote a feature on his experience at the Jim Russell Racing School at Willow Springs that foreshadowed his destiny behind the wheel. Al Unser's singular destiny was fulfilled at the 9th Annual California 500 when he became the only driver to win USAC's three 500-mile races at Indianapolis, Pocono, and Ontario in a single season. Mario Andretti's fateful destiny was fulfilled a week later at the place where his love of the sport began. The Italian Grand Prix was supposed to be Mario's dream. Instead, it turned into a nightmare. A first lap collision eliminated Schechter, Hunt, Patrese and Peterson's Lotus. Ronnie Peterson was gravely injured and the race finally restarted hours later at 6 p.m. as darkness approached. Andretti and Villeneuve led but they had both been adjudged to jump the start. They had a minute added to their race time giving them the win on the road but they would finish in 6th and 7th. The man who claimed maximum points would be Super Rat, Nicky Lauda, but he refused to climb up onto the podium. John Watson was second for Brabham Alpha, Reutemann third for Ferrari, Lafitte and Tombe fourth and fifth, ahead of Andretti, whose single point gave him the world championship. Ronnie Peterson underwent life-saving surgery on Sunday night, but by Monday morning, he'd been killed by a blood clot. But the sport and Mario Andretti raced onward. This Auto Club Championship Racing is here at one of the grand old tracks, Trenton, New Jersey. Hello, I'm Ken Squire, with me is David Hobbs. Here we are, ready for the start. And the field hurdles down to start the first of the 100 laps. This Andretti is pitting. Car number seven. Remember his last win, 1973, was right here on this track in USAC cars. Six wins in Formula One World Championship this year. Will he make the mark of Juan Manuel Donquio when he goes to Watkins Glen? October the 1st. You'll see the highlights the following week exclusively on CBS. Paul and two tenths second. Excellent pit stop for the Penske crew. And for the first time, I've never heard a crowd more enthusiastic in Trenton. I've been coming here for about 20 years. Mario and 
Brady has pulled it off. He's won. We're trying to get Brock H. down to him. Hey, champ, congratulations. I yeah. bet it's good to be back in the winner's circle here in the old U.S. of A., huh? Yeah, it's good because uh, it's been such a long time. In fact, the last two shot race that I won was right here at Trenton. So I was really aching for one. But congratulations, and we'll see you next week at Watkins Glass. Okay, thank you. Okay. Very, very happy man. Obviously, your first victory here in America since 1973, the new world champion, Mario Andretti. It was a unique moment in global racing. America's most famous racing driver was now the Formula One world champion. But Mario's moment of joy was muted by grief over losing his teammate and friend, and by disappointment in the final two races of the season. But anything now seemed possible for American racers, as Formula Atlantic star Bobby Rahal made his F1 debut, and his French-Canadian rival realized his improbable dream. But the hero of Montreal, Gilles Villeneuve. On the same weekend, another improbable dream was taking place at the Brands Hatch Circuit in England. Ted Squire with me today, Dan Gurney, and we're looking forward to a great race on a one and two tenths mile course here in England where the World Championship racing was held earlier this year. Covering the pits for today's race is Barry Gill. Let's go there now. We've waited about 13 years to welcome the USAC cars to Britain. Ever since first Jim Clark and then Graham Hill won a strange American ritual called Indianapolis. At the time we wondered what all the fuss was about. And then the Americans sent us a missionary, Mario Andretti, to preach the gospel of 900 horsepower cars and giants like A.J. Foyt. And now they're here. Well, what do we think of them first time round? Well, the cars aren't so different from Grand Prix cars, but the drivers, that's another story. They're competitive without being cutthroat. They're professional without being temperamental. But above all, they're nice, they're friendly, they're entertaining. They're a dream, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, you have your uh, Nicky Lauders and your Jody Schechters uh, rushing off in their helicopters or going into their hostility tents and, uh, uh, you know, here, I mean, they're ready to talk to you. As well, a lot of the racing drivers in Formula One and Formula Two come from really rich families and wealthy backgrounds. A lot of these guys don't. Some of these American racers displayed a wealth of talent in addition to their humility. Danny on Gaius in a lap unto himself and pretty much in a class by himself here today in this invasion by the United States Auto Club of English Racing Courses. First at Silverstone, AJ winning, and now here at Brands Hatch, England, it's Danny on Gaius Day. And I don't think any of the USAC drivers have come to grip with an Indy car on a road circuit like this in the manner that Danny has. He has really stood up and just battled that car all day and done a fabulous job. And all season, too, it's been a go or blow situation for him. Having won five, this would be a six. Now, here's Rick Mears running a very consistent second place. Arizona, New Mexico, California racer in the desert and turned to championship cars. And the leader, Danny Gaius, has broken down. He is pulled up just beyond the pits. Let's go to the pits and see if Barry Gill can give us a report. Look at the crowd applauding Danny Ongais there. A sporting British crowd appreciating that this man who wants to make it as a Grand Prix driver showed he had it as a USAC driver. His race ended, but certainly he's been the man of the day in this, the first ever USAC race at Brands Hatch. So Danny and Gaius will not win here on the road course at Brands Hatch today. Mears has inherited the first position. Looks like he's on his way to a road race victory at Brands Hatch, England. Checkered flags are about to fly. 26-year-old Rick Mears has won his third USAC championship car race. Mears, the winner. Congratulations on winning the first USAC race at Brands Hatch. What was it like? You just had to stay busy all day long. Uh, I'm, Danny was just running marvelous. You know, there's, I don't believe there's any way we could have touched him. Hey, Dan. I think we saw a future champion in Rick Mears. You can see he has that touch. He's not unruffled under this tremendous pressure. He adapted to a tremendously difficult circuit, and I'm very proud of Rick and all the other USAC drivers today. The success of Rick Mears and Danny and Gaius motivated me. Just four years earlier, they were racing in local Cal Club SCCA events, just like I was. 
I now wanted to race more than ever, but I was broke. So I did the next best thing and found a way to test drive an ADF Mark II Formula Ford, the car that had influenced my life from the start of my racing journey. My friend Richard Shirey, who was an accomplished racer and aerospace engineer, joined me as a sports car magazine test driver. So I now also had an excellent coach to help me improve my racing skills. The bonus was that the ADF Mark II we were testing was prepared by my mentor, Mike Hall, for my friend Mike Mokler, and it was SCCA runoffs ready. The ADF was effortlessly fast, which inspired me to commit myself to finding a way to race a current model Formula Ford in 1979. I also committed to helping my friend David Loring close the budget gap to allow him to take his and the Eagles' last shot at the SCCA runoffs held in Road Atlanta. At the same time, I convinced sports car publisher Paul Oxman to promote me to editor, which would soon prove to be a fateful decision for both of us. As I boarded my flight to Atlanta, I was cheerfully delusional about my magazine editing and racing abilities, but at least I was surrounded by people who set the bar high for performance under pressure. Upon arrival, I was immediately given a lesson in this, as Mike Hull was coping with a disaster. Mike Mokler had crashed and destroyed his ADF during practice, so he flew a backup car in from California overnight and prepped it in the transporter on the way to the track. Mokler started dead last in a huge field, while David Loring had qualified third in the Eagle. David pounced at the start and drove away from his pursuers, opening up the largest lead in Formula Ford runoff's history as the cars behind him battled for position. As he crossed the finish line, his engine began to seize, but he'd gotten the job done for Dan Gurney. Meanwhile, Mike Mokler had driven all the way from the back to an astonishing second place and David was as shocked as I was to see him on the podium. Mokler was then awarded the Road Racing Drivers Club Mark Donahue Award for his remarkable drive. These examples of courage and commitment inspired me as I created illustrations for the November issue of Sports Car that celebrated Mario Andretti's 1978 Formula One World Championship and America's first world champion, Phil Hill. But being the editor was already proving to be a challenge for me. Thankfully, Lorna Fitz was still there as executive editor and holding it all together. Another challenge was trying to help David Loring move forward in the sport as he searched for his next ride. Meanwhile, my clients Paul White and Jules Williams had sold the ADF project to Steve Anderson Racing, where Mike Hall had become the general manager, along with becoming a new columnist for Sports Car Magazine. As the year ended, I reflected on how far I'd come since my teenage past-forging antics seven years earlier at Ontario Motor Speedway, where I'd first witnessed American racer Mario Andretti take on the best in the world and win. So now, anything seemed possible in the year ahead. But little did I know that what Dan Gurney, Roger Penske, and fellow team owner Pat Patrick were working on would soon rock the racing world and influence my journey for decades to come.